Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending December 7th. Thank you everybody that were patient while I took a week off and thank you very much for the comments, especially I would like to do a shout out to my buddy Howard Wacko Crow, which mentioned he mentioned in a uh, chat that I was in that he missed the TDD Weekly Report last week. So I'm glad you guys enjoy it enough that you actually miss it when I'm gone and take a break for the holidays. I appreciate that very much. First up, this was sent in from my buddy Steve Arsenault from Nashville. Um, 700,000 year old horse found in Yukon permafrost yields oldest DNA ever recorded. This pushes back, I guess, the direct ancestry line according to people that study these kind of things, uh, pushes it back by about twice as long for the original ancestors of the domestic horse. And it's kind of cool, the technique they used. Uh, they, uh, when they originally got this um, horse, this ancient horse out of the permafrost, they didn't have the technology to be able to even do uh, genetic sequencing on it. But because of some increases in knowledge and increases in uh, sophistication of the techniques and stuff like that, they could actually directly look at the molecules and do some GNA um, sequencing. Now, I'm no expert. I'm, I'm way out of my area here trying to figure anything out, but I remember reading articles about the fact that when they've got fragments and pieces of DNA, they use a process called amplification to where I guess they connect and connect together the dots or whatever like that or the puzzle pieces to try to determine what the original DNA looked like, and I guess you can introduce a lot of errors by doing it that way. Well, somehow this new technique they use, is, they use looks at the original molecules themselves and puts them um, puts that out as far as the information and the data, so introduces less errors. And to me, the thing I really like about this is not just the fact that maybe someday we may be able to bring back the original type of horses that lived in, the, in North America before they went extinct here and then had to be brought back over to Europe, but also the fact I'm still ever since a kid on that kind of tirade or whatever you want to call it to uh, bring back the, the mammoth because of the fact that it's, I think it's a better than 50-50 shot that uh, we as humans destroyed them here on this continent, so it would be nice to kind of bring them back in some form if possible. So, yeah, if we can get the genetic sequencing down, maybe that's something we could actually do, at least in the limit. I mean, I'm sure we're not going to bring massive amounts of them back, but maybe even a, a small herd of mammoths. So they're actually still back living in their original continent before they got destroyed. And next up, this is from... My buddy Gary, Pseudo GJ, Navy launches UAV from submerged submarine. Oh, and as before I get more into this article, as usual, all the links will be down below to all of the articles. And this is from fizz.org. This is kind of cool because it's uh, a drone, a surveillance drone that's launched from a submarine, and it uses the same techniques as launching a cruise missile. So they use the same kind of canister. It, it pops up to the surface, looks a little bit like a buoy, and then the canister opens up, and this little unmanned aerial vehicle pops out. And uh, if you get a chance, click on the picture, too. I'll put the picture up here of what it looks like, but this picture, you can enlarge it to uh, quite a nice size so you can get some good detail on it. And the wing, uh, after it pops out of the canister, the wings kind of unfold so that the thing can fly properly, and it flies for up to about six hours. They don't say, and I'm kind of curious as to what the recovery system is, or do they just consider it expendable? Do they just... I don't know, land it somewhere, crash it in the ocean, whatever, so um, the enemy doesn't get a hold of it or whatever. But the other cool thing about this is from concept to first test launch, it was six years, so they put it on some kind of an accelerated program. So if you get a chance, uh, read this. It's kind of cool that we can get in submarines uh, a lot closer than we can other kinds of ships and stuff like that to where we want to end up uh, getting some information or some intel on something. And if you can get a submarine in there and have a drone fly around for six hours, probably be quite a bit helpful. And what's up next? This was sent in by two people, actually. Clash230 sent this in first, and then after that, 1954 Shadow sent me a link to another site talking about it. Biggest cosmic explosion ever seen. This was back in spring, in April, and what happened is a star exploded and formed into a black hole, and... The cool thing about this is not just the fact of how large it was, and it even uh, peaked some of the instruments and stuff like that. The uh, instruments went up to uh, as, as high as they could possibly register and just maxed out. Um, the interesting thing is that scientists theoretically thought an explosion uh, of gamma rays this large was not really theoretically possible. It actually went larger than according to their theory. So I think that means they're going to go back into the drawing board and have to rethink the theories. But that's kind of cool, too, when things happen in science that 
have you scratching your head and it's like, well, wait a minute, this was supposed to be impossible. Well, uh, it's not impossible if you're observing it. So that's kind of cool. I would also like you guys to compare. I'm going to put two different links here to it. Uh, one is a link from uh, major news media. This is foxdfw.com. And believe me, I'm not picking on Fox because all the major news media do this. But just look at the fact of the way the drama they portray with the lack of information in their description of the article versus the other article I have from Los Alamos National Laboratory. It's just kind of weird. Uh, if, you, if you just talk about the very first paragraphs and that they talk about, well, if this was closer, the, the whole Earth would have been, you know, a, a cinder and the atmosphere would have been blown away and the Earth would have been toast, things like that. But it's like, yeah, duh. I mean, if the Earth was 100,000 miles away from the sun, the Earth would be toast. But it's not. I mean, that's the other thing about it, too. The, uh, the drama in the article is kind of, but, you know, then again, they're, they're writing for an audience, whereas they're not writing for uh, science like the the Los Alamos one, but I, th I think you'll get a real kick out of it if you compare the two things, and, and it is a once-in-a-century thing, too, like, uh, well, at least, see, this is another thing, it's theoretically a once-in-a-century happening. It could just as likely next year they find a cosmic explosion with gamma rays that's even bigger than this one, but some scientists say that, you know, it, it may be the only one they get to see in their career, so it's a good thing we had the instruments to be able to, to work with this one. And this next one was sent to my sent to me by my buddy Dodge Ryder, and this is something I kind of suspected myself, although I didn't know the exact figures. But evidently, an insurance company called Equity Red Star has done a study, and they say motorcyclists are 23 percent better behind the wheel of a car. And I would say that's pretty much something I would agree with too. We're more proactive driver, we're more defensive drivers, or you know, we're just used to expecting people to do crazy stuff. So if you're proactive in your driving, you're a very defensive driver, you're always going to be involved in less accidents. Um, some people brought up, uh, can bring up the argument that, well, motorcycle riders in general tend to be younger and have better reflexes, which is true. So what they did was they somehow used statistics and they compensated for that, and it still came out that uh, they were 20, 21 percent better behind the wheel even when factored in for age. So they took that into account too, and we're still, you know, um, I think anything 20% or above is very, very significant, and that's kind of cool to know that um, just the skill of riding and operating a motorcycle, if you do it successfully, is going to make you a better car driver, and I think that's absolutely true. I totally would agree with that. This next one was sent by my buddy Vec PNE, Chernobyl. Now, this, this is cool, too. This article's got more than uh, one thing in here that I, I find interesting. It's from Doug's Dark World, Major Biological Discovery Inside the Chernobyl Reactor. Now, this was discovered a little while back. There's this kind of black slime, and they did some tests on it, and they found out this black slime inside the nuclear reactor was thriving in a very highly radioactive environment. They found out that this, um, this uh, fungi used melanin and uh, used melanin the same way we use it in our skin to uh, to uh, absorb radiation but it actually um, not only absorbed the radiation from the cosmic rays and the gamma rays but it uh, what it did was it actually I shouldn't say cosmic rays they're they're gamma, they're gamma rays because they're produced on earth but um, it took the these gamma rays and actually used them as an energy source so instead of using sunlight with chlorophyll these were these fungi were using melanin um, in much the same way and using gamma rays as the energy source um, I've got another link here, too, from scienceagogo.com, where it talks about they took some of this uh, back to the lab and tested it out just to be sure that it was it was doing that. And sure enough, the, the melanin itself was actually chemically changing with exposure to gamma radiation and being used as an energy source for the fungi. They're talking about possibly in the future maybe using this in outer space as astronauts travel, say, from Earth to Mars, there's going to be abundance of gamma radiation, very dangerous gamma radiation, and if they can actually grow these fungi as a food source using the gamma radiation as energy to grow them, it might solve a problem. And last up, um, this one myself I've been watching because I saw the uh, conference that they had in NASA about Comet Ison, and the, they're, some are declaring it's still alive, some are declaring it dead. Um, I don't know how you would really call it, but I, I can show you this picture right here from astronomy.com, and it appears if there is anything left, it's it's maybe just tiny, tiny pieces, and maybe we won't even be able to, by the time it comes overhead uh, close to the Earth, we might not even be able to see anything, and um, yeah, it does look like if it's, if it's not totally dead, it's about maybe 90% gone, but if you check out this picture, it's entering from the bottom right, and then it's leaving from the top, and then veering off to the right, and it looks like there isn't much left but tiny, tiny pieces. So 
I would say it's probably pretty accurate. Um, there might be some remnants and dust particles and maybe little pebbles left, but I think we can kind of call it that uh, there is not, not going to be any show around Christmas time. I think Comet Ison is dead, but like I said before, even a comet like this being totally destroyed um, by yielding, you know, is going to yield all kinds of science uh, data for us and all kinds of things to help with theories in the future for comets and stuff like that. So uh, maybe it did us a good service by doing this instead of totally surviving intact. Maybe now we know a little bit more information than we did before and maybe a lot more information than we did before. So um, I don't think any kind of scientific ob observation, whether we get the results we like or the results we don't like, I don't think it's ever a failure. If we learn something, it's good science. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. Thank you for sending the huge amounts of material in for me. I really appreciate it a lot. I will talk to you guys next week.